everybody, Scoutcrafty here again. It's Monday. That means just we got a little bit of a mosh today. Beautiful day. I can't be downstairs too long. And you can see, you see, uh, that's patches laying on the, the sidewalk over there. But uh, anyway, we're going to go downstairs, get something done, and uh, let's hey, get to it. First off, today we wanted to talk about uh, a drill I picked up at the flea market uh, last week. But uh, I want to go through the transitions of, of how drills evolved. So let's go now, check that out. Back in the 40s and 50s when hand drills were becoming more and more popular, they were all metal affairs, just like this one here. Uh, they lasted for a long, and, and they were very durable, good drills, a little bit on the heavy side. They usually had either a magnesium or a aluminum type of housing. But again, they were a little bit on the heavy side. Uh, they started introducing plastics. Now, the public wasn't too crazy about plastic at the time because it wasn't proven. But even though plastics in one form or another have been around since the 20s and 30s, you know, with Bakelite and things like that. But um, they tried to in incorporate it. Now, a lot of old timers, when you're going to uh, buy a drill and you had a choice between these two, a lot of times they would opt for the all metal drill but um eventually these high impact and industrial plastics that they used to use really uh took over and you can remember the old telephones that was uh th that plastic was almost indestructible you could slam them down so they were using some really good plastics and and it eventually it won over the public and they started to buy them uh this one here is an early a black and decker and this one is the one i just picked up at the flea market from phil and a beautiful little drill, a quarter inch, black and decker. I like the looks of it, the black with the silver, you know, the aluminum, polished aluminum. Just, a, it was a nice looking drill. Uh, not too heavy. It's a two speed drill. And uh, I'll show you how that now, works. Now, because it's two speed, you can see it says low and high. And this little button here is to lock it into one position. So you can see here. That's your two speeds. If you want to lock it into a position, if you're doing some grinding or something, you pull the trigger all the way back and push this button. Then you press the trigger to release it. So uh, that's been on for a long time. But uh, these are nice little drills. I paid $5 for this just the other day. Really nice little drill. Now this is the drill. This one here is the one that my mom gave me when I was about, I guess about 13 years old. It came in a case. I have the case. It's buried somewhere. I don't know where it is. But it came with a case. And the case included the little flap disc that you could do sanding and a buffing wheel, things like that. It was a kit. This is a variable now, speed. If you drill. notice a couple things happened here from this drill to this drill, and now it's uh, the drills became double insulated. So now you are protected more against shock. And uh, this one here had a grounded cord on it. This one didn't need a grounded cord, but you could see it had more three quarters of the housing was plastic compared to here, which only one third is. So uh, big difference. Now, this is variable speed. Another thing you'll notice is the handle. The handle is a little bit short. If you notice, you know, even I, my hands, I, I got pretty big hands, but still only three fingers wrap around the handle. Whereas with the older drill here, you know, I could get my whole, my whole hand on the handle so this one here you know this is the way they started to design drills and you know it was a little bit different but uh this was my first drill i didn't know any better but i always one thing i thought was really funny about this is if you look at the color during the early 70s olive dr olive green was the craze uh refrigerators uh furniture Olive, everything was olive green and it was uh, only for a couple of years and you know they came out now when they started using the plastics they can make any color they wanted so they picked this for a few years it's really a putrid color. Now, the one good thing I'd like to say about this drill is that the variable speed uh, was in the switch here and what would happen is it would go after a while it wouldn't uh, operate variable speed but the good thing is that it would still operate it just wasn't variable speed that's the problem with this drill the variable speed is shot but the drill still operates. I'll show you how that works. As you can see, it's just, it's like a one speed drill, but it, I prefer it. If it's going to break, I like to break this way that it still operates, even though I don't have the low speed. Now here's a later model, Black & Decker, uh, variable speed drill, again, double insulated. And you could see it's got the, you know, three quarter uh, plastic, but now they made it orange, a little bit more appealing to most people. And, um, one thing about this variable speed is the variable speed is on the trigger here. Now I don't, it, it, that's, 
up to you, you know, whether you like that or not. Um, I prefer the trigger where you, but you know, sometimes if you uh, we're using it in a drill press or something you could this would lock you could lock the, the speed in and set your speed this way So it's it's all preference. It had the forward and reverse, which is a nice feature Which uh, only came out and you know for the most part in the 70s with the black and Decker and then he, your locking uh, Button was over here. You could lock the trigger over here one common weakness you're always going to find with the quarter drills this is called a strain relief and it's supposed to stop the cord from breaking or bending it it gives it instead of having a sharp end it gives it a light end but they would tend to uh fail down here and um but the strain reliefs and this is where your cords uh, always became a problem black and decker realized that for a short time and they came out with you this notice on the back of this plug here if you there's a little double-sided switch one on each you just turn it like this you give it like a click like that and this plug will pull right out and you can see here it has the two prongs here and you could replace the cord the cord was always a big problem and you can see here so look it's taped up you know from but uh that was a, a interesting design of, of trying to get away that you didn't have to replace the whole drill you could just replace the cord but you know that only ran for a couple of years it was a good idea but I guess Black & Decker wanted to sell more drills and they said, get away, do away the with that. Same Christmas that I got my Black & Decker drill kit, I also got this uh, uh, Black & Decker um, jigsaw. And uh, you can see here, it's a model 7538 two-speed jigsaw. And, you know, it came with the owner's manual and the ID card and things like that. Beautiful jigsaw. I have lots of hours. I've made so many projects with this thing. I do need to, you know, clean it up and restore it. But it was not, again, it was a painted housing instead of a polished uh, aluminum housing. But uh, their jigsaws back then were really good. They held up well. Uh, again, with the olive green, you know, that was, that was what they were pushing back then in the 70s. And then they did away with that and went to more colors that were more universally accepted. But um, they, they, Black & Decker was big with these kits. Remember the, the old metal one we did? But then they went to plastic. Then after the plastic, you know, now it, uh, you just got them in a box. But it was, uh, it was nice back then and it lasted me a good time. These, these were good tools back okay, then. Okay, next up, back about 15 or 20 years ago, Husky, the name Husky. Years ago, Husky was a really good name in tools. Then they started getting a little bit, uh, you know, a lot of import stuff. And then they said back in, I guess, I don't know, maybe about 15 years ago, they said, we're going to start making good tools again. They came out with some decent design. Now they're all, forget it, they're shot again. So <laughs> Husky is a, is a strange brand. And I'll tell you, it's it, you, you never know where you're going with that. But my buddy Brian and I, we were talking about these convertible plies. He asked me if I ever saw them. And I had these for years. And believe it or not, these came in really handy because I rewired my whole basement with these pliers because they were just uh, handy. You know, they had the, you know, over here you had the, um, obviously the needle nose pliers with the wire strip is built in. Worked really good. They're very sharp. And then with just a flip of a wrist, you had your... Your lineman's pliers with your side cutter and things like that. It had a nice curve to the handle. They were very comfortable, lightweight. Again, it only took a second to convert from one plier to the other. Now, this is an older design. This design has been around for years. It was, you know, developed, I guess, in the 30s or something. But nobody produces these really anymore. But really interesting design here. Again, with the smaller needle nose. Flip it around. And then you have a, a diagonal cutter. So, uh, and I like this curved handle here. It's curved here to fit your palm, curved here. It's just really nice. And when you flip it around, you get those same curves again. It's like magic, right? <laughs> so anyway, I thought these were pretty cool. I was wondering if any of you guys ever seen these before. They made them in a two set like this. They came in a package and uh, I don't know. You never see these type anymore. Pretty cool. Okay, plant. last up. Last time I was at the flea market, I picked this up for $2. And uh, it's, it's a little beat up here. It's got some... It was hammered on top, you could see, and it deformed this face over here. But uh, there's no markings or anything. I use these quite a bit, these little pry bars, and I have no idea what's under this tape. So I'm going to unwrap that and take a look at okay, it. Okay, this is interesting. Uh, this is what it's supposed to look like. You could see here the tip just uh, goes out to a normal V there. You can get under a nail or something like that. But I don't know now if this was an attempt... If they had to get around the bolt or something, or I, I doubt it broke off even on both sides. It looked like maybe I was in, I don't know. So, you know something? I'm going to have to think about what I could, I have a couple choices here. I can make it uh, rounded out nicely so that I can get behind a rounded area. I could uh, 
cut it here and regrind it so that it's just a little bit shorter but does the same thing so i have to think about this what i want to do with this but uh, that's pretty interesting see the tape hid that damage but uh, believe me, uh, it's not a problem if I can just figure out what I want to do with it. I use these mostly as pry bars rather than nail pullers. So let me think about it. Okay, only took about a minute to cut off the, uh, the tips here that uh, were damaged. Now what I'm going to have to do is reprofile it because, you know, this has to, again, it has to taper down. You see at the end. So I'm going to reprofile the top here using the angle grinder and the uh, cutoff wheel. And then maybe we can enlarge that a little bit, but uh, it's coming good. This is just the way I want it. Now, one of the reasons I picked this project to do is because I just wanted a little bit more time on the angle grinder. I'm really enjoying the angle grinder, especially for getting some of the deep pits and things like that out. And I just want to get better at, at using the tool. And every time you use the tool, you do get better. So that's why I went with that. Now you know my favorite part. Remember what this pry bar looked like before we started. And we're calling this project done. I think this came out really nice, huh? Especially the top here it was all banged up and everything. Uh, I didn't, again didn't take it to a total mirror finish, but uh, it's close and it's good because there's no fingerprints. When you leave a little bit of that grain in there, you don't get the fingerprints. I gave it a coat of wax over wood, and here's what we did with the tip. Um, you know, once we cut it down, profiled it, and like I said, I didn't make a big V groove because I don't use these for pulling nails, but I use them more for pry bars. So uh, I got nice uh, thickness there, and the back is is nice. I, I, I'm really happy with this, and uh, I love these tools. And the, the one thing I really, really stress is whenever you take down a little bit of finish on both sides, you're going to leave sharp edges. And you have to go over every edge, you know, at a 45-degree angle so that you see all these edges are softened so when you feel this it's like buttery smooth in your hand and that's the best part of of redoing these type of tools so here's that two dollar probably a bridgeport uh nail puller and i did another video on on restoring these but this one here i, I just enjoy uh feeling these when they're all smoothed out and, and stuff we, you never see them like that so anyway hope you enjoyed this one thanks very much another monday in the can Hope you have a good week. Take care now. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.